If you've got a Bible this morning, if you want to turn to Romans 5, and I want to talk about you know, your anchor in times of adversity, uh, times of trouble. You see, if we talk about a metaphor as, as a storm, we're, we're quite familiar with storms in life. We don't really have hurricanes and tornadoes, but we do have uh, floods every now and then and storms. Not so much up here, because we're usually on hills. But it's a metaphor often used for storms in our own life. Physical storms, emotional storms, spiritual storms. Storms in the family. Christmas is that time of year where families come together and sometimes there's storms. It, it lets go and you know you put on your best face and you smile but you know and sometimes Christmas is not what people often think it is. It's some people don't like it, some people love it so it's all different. But it's where your anchor is that really matters. As a rock climber or somebody used to rock climb a lot I understood the idea of an anchor because sometimes I'd put things in the rocks to hold my weight and it was always good. I liked to do it myself, put them in because I knew whether they'd hold or not. I tended not to rely on other people's because I was never sure. But there's some devices that I've got at home that could literally carry my weight and probably about three other people's weight in a, in a rock and it just holds us because the anchor is secure. So my question is, what do we put our, set our anchors in in the times of trouble? Now we often say in Jesus, but really what does that look like? It's easy to say, but what does it look like? So I'm going to read a little bit from a Bible, from uh, Romans chapter 5. And like I said, next year I'm going to dig into Romans a lot more uh, as we go through. But I just thought I'd pull this in. This is a sermon, actually, I was looking through my computer and I found it uh, from years ago. But I just thought, I'm not rehashing, I am actually technically, but actually, I just thought it may be needed this morning for people. So verse 1, it says this, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we gain access by faith into the grace by which we now stand. <clears throat> and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we glory in our sufferings, because we know that sufferings produces perseverance, Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not, dis does not disappoint us, or in this verse, and shame us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who he has given us. You see, that just at the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will somebody die for a righteous person, though for a good person, somebody might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrated his own love for us in this, that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by the blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more being reconciled shall we be saved in, through his life? Not only is this so, but we know we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now been reconciled. It's interesting that the book of Romans goes through a lot of things, but one thing it keeps hammering up, it keeps reminding us of, of where we were, and then it reminds us of, of where we are. And we need to remember that. So, first point, if you are taking notes, Tony's not here, so he can't do his mind maths, but for those who need it from the house group, point one would be, we need to realise our present position. You see, our position in God is not determined by the price of, of gas or anything else. It may be physical, uh, the heat we have in our rooms, but at the end of the day, our position in God, it says this in verse 1, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now gained access by faith into this grace by which we now stand. We have, Paul is reflecting on our present position that we are right now. The position we're in is that we have access to God right now. Acts 13, 38 says this. Brothers, listen. We know that we, we are here to proclaim that through this man Jesus, there is forgiveness of sins. For everyone who believes in him as is declared right with God. Something that the law of Moses could never do. So our position 
right now as believers is that we are right before God. You might say, Johnny, but I don't feel right before God. It's not about where we feel, it's our position. You see, I often question people when they say, I feel this. It's kind of like, well, that's great for today, but tomorrow you'll feel somewhat different. You know, I've been told recently that if you eat a lot of dark chocolate, the percentage is that you, you're less likely to be depressed. I thought, well, if you eat dark chocolate, anybody who eats chocolate, it's not really going to depress them anyway. It might do later on if they eat too much and it goes on to the tummy, um, which I'm not at the minute, and I've actually gone down another size on my belt. That's two. I'm pulling it back now. So, but we have access of the... Point one is that we have access to God, and part of that is that we, we have access right into God. Paul tells us that we have peace with God, and this concept, you know, if you read through chapters one to four, it's outlaying where we stood, that without God we believe. And it talks about the wrath of God, verse 18 of chapter one says, For the wrath of God has been revealed from heaven against all the ungodliness and all the unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth uh, in their unrighteousness. He talks about how God is dealing with the world and how God, people have tried to do whatever they can to come before God, but it's only through Jesus. So we, have, we are accepted by God and we have access to God. You know, we've got a privilege that we can come before Him at any time. Even in the dark times, we can always call out to Him. In the shadows, He's always there with us. In Hebrews 10 verse 19 on, it says this, and so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened a new and living way through the curtain into the most holy place. You've got to go back into Matthew where when Jesus died, it says the curtain in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. I mean, I wonder about the shock on people's face when the curtain was ripped in two because people could come to the outside of that curtain but very rarely did anybody go beyond that curtain, but now it was torn too. And the fact that we know that the Ark of the Covenant, which was so precious to the Israelites, the Jews, was behind there, had been removed years before. So when the curtain was ripped in two, what did they see? An empty room. I mean, that's kind of like the Wizard of Oz moment, isn't it? When Dorothy notices a curtain. Like, what's the point? But Jesus has ripped out, why? To let us into access to God, but also to let God out. The curtain was a barrier between God and man, and Jesus sp um, crossed that barrier and brought God and man together. Since we have this great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting Him. For our guilty conscience has been sprinkled with Christ's blood and makes us clean and our bodies have been washed with pure water. We don't often, we read through that, that's the New Living Translation, but people skip through it, that when we have our conscience sprinkled by the blood, that cleanses the conscience as well. So not only are we have our sins being washed away, but our shame has been washed away, and we can approach God with a clean conscience. You can say, but I haven't got a clean conscience. That's because you're remembering what you did when God doesn't remember what you've done. Now, God doesn't forget, but he said he puts it away. He chooses not to remember what you've done. So if he chooses not to remember what you've done, why should we? I'm mean, about when you've dealt with it. If he keeps reminding you of something, it's because you need to deal with it. But if you keep reminding yourself of it, it's probably the devil having a word in your ear. So pick who we want to listen to. So we've got access to God and we're accepted by God. We can approach God because of his grace. Before... Our justification before we were saved, we stood before God as condemned criminals and now we stand before him as sons and daughters of God. And that's something to hold on to as an anchor in the times of trouble. But before God, before you became a Christian, before you came to God, you were a condemned person. But now as a Christian, as a believer in God, as someone who's given their life to God, you stand before him as a son and daughter of God with all the privileges that goes. Now, I'll be funny, but when I was young on Christmas Day, there were presents downstairs for me. Why? Because I was a child of my parents. The neighbours' kids didn't have presents in my house. They had presents in their own house. So as a child of God, we can go before God at any time, and it's like Christmas every day of the year. 
Well, I like that one anyway. You know, it, we don't, it's, with God it's completely different to the world. So the second point is, you know, we, we need to reflect on our future hope. I don't know if anyone's seen the WhatsApp thing that I put on talking about faith, but everything's about faith. It's only a, a minute and a half long. It's a, a good thing to listen to. But we need to reflect on our hope, on our future, because if we reduce it, we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Now, the word rejoice is not some half hearted smile. You know what I mean? Or a false smile. It's a genuine, heartfelt sense of rejoicing. And the word hope there, we, we've got this word hope in our language, which is a, I hope for the best. 50 50. Maybe. Maybe not. Who knows? But the word hope in the Bible is a, is a, is a, sense, a sense of sureness that something is going to happen. The better word would be in English is a confidence that we have. So we can rejoice in the hope of, of the glory of God. Romans 8 verse 18 says this, For we consider that our sufferings in this present day are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed to us. The song that was sung earlier, our hey, long to breathe the air of heaven. You know, we do need to keep our feet on the ground, but also looking forward that one day we'll be there with God. Everything will be gone. And there will come a day where some will never pass away, they'll get shot straight up there. The message puts it this way, that's why I don't think there's any comparison between the present hard times and the coming uh, uh, good times in heaven. That's why sometimes in times of persecution the church gears up and it talks a lot about the future state and where they're going to be. And that spurs them on because everything down here is temporary. I think it's kind of annoying, isn't it, if you're paying to your pension all your life and get to 66 and die. You don't get the benefits of a pension. However, if you live to 99, you need it. So I'm not saying don't get a pension. But, you know, the things that we lay up in heaven for us are permanently and forever. The things that we have down here are only temporary. Even though we need to be wise down here. So, we reflect on our future. We've got access to God. We've got reconciliation with God's purposes. You know, it goes through this that persecution produces patience and patience, hope and hope, character. We don't like all that stuff. But the fact is, it's part of life. If I ask a question, and I'm not, it's a rhetorical one, but realistic, how many of us like suffering? Unless you're a real self armor most people would say no. Most people don't like suffering. As a child, we were punished often by, by my mum. She made us watch Coronation Street. It was punishment for us. And if we were really bad, she made us watch Crossroads, which you'll have to Google, young people. And we had to suffer that. And, if, and then when EastEnders came out, it, we were doomed. That were it, you know what I mean? I'd rather take the beating. But none of us liked suffering. And, you know, there's not many people actually say to me, Johnny, celebrate with me because I'm going through suffering. Which he says, we rejoice in our suffering, but nobody ever says to me, I'm rejoicing in my suffering. Because in the world's perspective, that's totally mental. The rejoicing isn't the fact that we should walk around celebrating, going, I'm suffering, I'm suffering, I'm really, really suffering. It's a case of, I've got a security inside, an anchor down in a rock that's stable, that no matter what happens in this time of trouble, I've got an anchor, therefore I can rejoice, because James says, our suffering produces some amazing things in us. But none of us like the suffering. Question, in the darkest times of your past, when you've looked back, when you look at your, your history, I would say that Jesus, you felt Jesus closest to you in the darkest times, in the suffering times. Yet none of us want to be in the suffering times. But often it's in the suffering times when we find Jesus the closest. It's not that he moves. It's just that we do. And in the dark times, that's when we cling the hardest to him. It's just a thought that when we're fighting tooth and nail and kicking and screaming out of suffering, God's saying this is where we are the closest. 
He says, says, we need to remember that, he says, that we know. We need to know where our anchors are. Romans 8, 28 says this, that we know that in all things God works together for those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. It's a great verse, but do we know it? That we know. You know, it says that, you know, as we rejoice in our sufferings because our sufferings produce us persevere. If we don't know what it's producing, it's hard to go through these things. And perseverance produces character and character hope. But hope, it says, does not put us to shame or does not, you know, hurt us. This passage is not an attempt. Paul is not trying to tell you the why people go through suffering, but he's giving us hope in the suffering. He's not saying why every bad thing happens to every person and why does bad things happen to good people. He's not attempting to answer that, but he's saying there's a higher level you need to look at this. There's a spiritual level, level in this. And in our suffering, it's only physical, but in our spiritual, we can soar like the eagle. And there's a two, in the world's perspective, suffering brings the soul down. Like when you put on the sad songs, it becomes miserable. And it brings a soul down, but our spirit as believers can soar like the eagle. We can get a perspective well above everybody else. There's a poem that, I, I can't remember where I got it from, but I've, it's down here. It says this, I walked a mile with pleasure, she chattered all the way, but left me none the wiser with all she had to say. I walked a mile with sorrow, and never a word she said. Behold the things I learnt from her when sorrow walked with me. She said she with me. You learn more sometimes in the times of trouble than you do in the times of great joy. So we can have a confidence and even in our worstest times we can have this confidence because hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit that he has given us. The fourth thing to remember is that we need a fourth anchor is to recall God's amazing love. Think back to God's amazing love in your life. That you've survived everything that's been thrown at you to this point. But I gave in. You've still survived it. You know, I, did, I don't think I did. No, you're still here. You survived it. And there will, there will be trouble ahead. But you'll survive that. Because you remember, the anchor, it says, verse 6 of chapter 5 in Romans, it says, You see that just at the right time, when you were powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, but for a good person, somebody might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates all love for us, that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. If that's what he was willing to do for us while we were enemies of God, imagine what he's prepared to do for us and with us now as children of God. You know, I've heard parents who adopt kids. They don't go down to the adopting agency and just give everybody presents and throw them around. They wait till they pick the child that they want and then give them the presents. And while we're out there in the world before we're Christians, God demonstrated his love for us. In other words, he opened up a way for us. But the blessings are only when we come in. So, imagine what God's got for us. If that's what he, he did to open a way for us, imagine what he'll do with us. The problem is that we think of things from a worldly perspective and not from a spiritual perspective. Because God is more interested in getting people saved than he is. Now, hear me right on this. Than he is our little problems that we're going through. He is concerned about our problems because he wants us to grow and trust him and walk in faith in the problems, but he's concerned about the things that are going on in other people's lives who aren't saved. You're going, well, that sounds a bit selfish. Well, you're saved and you're going to go to heaven. The person down the road isn't. Somebody asked me recently, Johnny, why do you think I'm going through this problem? And I said, because I'd read the verse <laughs> earlier on, I said, you're going through this problem so that in six months or a year's time you're going to help somebody who's got the exact same problem they said i don't think that's fair i said i think it is because you let those put that person come to jesus and i said but i don't want to go through his problem and i went suck it up guys don't look at me thinking you know it's all right for you i'm messed up okay 
inside I'm kind of messed up most of the time at the minute it seems like a turmoil I think God spoke to Joe about something and it's all gone messy since then God's dealing with a lot of issues so don't think I'm, out, I'm excluded from this it's no I'm still in there with you but I need to put my anchors down like you need to put your anchors down you see humans without Christ are described as people without strength they're ungodly they're sinners and they're enemies of God but people with Jesus I've got the strength of God. He says, walk well, in his strength, not in our strength. We've got his righteousness. We're no longer enemies and our sins have been washed away. God's love is not motivated by anything in us. His love towards us wasn't motivated because of how good we were. His love for us was motivated because he loved us. Because his love is unmerited and it's not dependent upon us. I've said this loads of times before. If there's nothing you can do to make God love you less, and there's nothing you can do to make him love you more. However, there are consequences to your actions if you muck around with the wrong stuff. God's love is permanent. It's a possession that we as children of God have bathed upon us. How deep the Father's love, 1 John, I think it's 3, verse 1 or 5, verse 1. How deep the Father's love is that is poured upon us. And the last one, the last anchor we need to do is rejoicing in God's person, who God is. Because it started with him and it ends with him. And everything in between is all about him anyway. And our problems and circumstances, guys, we've just got to cling on for 70, 80, 90, 100 years. And then we've got total eternity ahead of us. You all look at my going, 70, 80, 90 years is a long time. Not compared to eternity. I mean, in God's view, Abraham is just leaving what is Iraq. In God's view, he's already got the Millennium Kingdom set in place. He sees Adam taking that throne from Eve, and he sees Jesus setting up his throne. He sees it all. And right there somewhere, two-thirds or maybe right at one end, your life. If you ever go to a graveyard, I've done a family tree, it's interesting, you go up around, it gives the names, it gives who's related to, and then it says something like, you know, it gives a date of birth, and then there's a dash, and the date of death. Our life is summed up in a dash. See, nobody remembers my ancestors, and there's some, I come back to the 1700s, it's quite fascinating. But nobody remembers them. And the sad thing is, in 200 years, people won't remember me if we're still here. Unless they get the CDs or, you know, the look up. But chances are YouTube will have been replaced by something completely different. And who knows what life will be. I don't think we'll be here then. You know, I'm like, uh, Eden, I think God's going to return very fast. You know what I mean? He's on his way. It's going to really bring things. But we need to have our anchors down so when the storm comes, we can keep going. He says this. Since we have now been justified by the blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath? Through him, that's through Jesus. For if that while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more having been reconciled shall we be saved through this life? Saved through this life. You know, as Christians, we don't die. We just fall asleep. That's what the Bible says. Why? Because death... <laughs> in its purest sense, is separation. So, if you chop somebody's hand off, it dies. Why? Because it's separated from the wrist. You know, if you chop somebody's head off, the body dies and the head. Because the book beneath the heart, beneath the brain. Death is technically separation. But as Christians, we don't die from God. We just fall asleep until we get that trumpet sound and those people rise up. Those people who are still alive will actually, they'll skip the death part and just get resurrected bodies and up we go. Which I think is pretty cool really. And I believe in that as much as I did, if not more so, than when I first got saved because we're now closer by 30 odd years. But the Bible talks very clearly that salvation involves justification. That means, you know, just as if you'd never sinned. So you've been saved, you've been saved, that's the past tense, from the penalty of sin. You've been sanctified. It's a, another posh word. It just means you've been set apart. And you've been saved, present tense, from the power of sin. And it said in the Bible that you'll be glorified. That means we'll get a better body. Better everything that we've got now. And that means, uh, that's, that's future tense, that we'll be saved from the presence of sin. One day, 
God's going to mash up this earth, make it all brand new, new heavens, new earth, and sin is going to be no more. No more. Isn't it annoying for you drivers when you try to, when you try to keep to the speed limit and you see cars going boom, boom, past you? And then when you creep forward and you get blue lights behind you, it's like they can mess up and they never get caught. Yet yeah, you think if you step out of line, you've definitely got caught. And God goes, yes. <laughs> you know what I mean? Why? Just the way things are. I think God's grace is on people, sinners in particular, because he knows that as soon as they close their eyes in death, they've lost their eternity. But well, Abby still demonstrates love and grace towards them, which I don't think is justified, but I am not God. That song says, he is God and I am not. Otherwise, I don't really, things would be different. But the truth is, God still pouring out grace to these people. See, God has already pronounced his verdict. It says, By, uh, but now you have been united with Christ. Once you were far away from God, but now you have been brought near through the blood of Jesus. That's a verdict. That's where you stand. You were far, now you've been brought uh, forward. So chapter, so Romans 5.11 says this, So now you can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because of our Lord Jesus Christ who has made us friends with God. That's the New Living Translation. We can rejoice through the suffering. Why? Because we know that we are now friends with God. Right there. See, the storms in life are going to happen. It's inevitable. They're going to come. Whether you're a Christian or not, that's irrelevant. Storms come. It's just that we've got an anchor that we can hold on. Like that song goes from years ago. I didn't look it up, but I couldn't find a decent version of it. It says, we have an anchor that keeps, uh, uh, keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the bellows roads fastened to the rock that cannot move, grounded firm and deep in the Saviour's love. We have an anchor. And it's in Jesus. And as long as we keep hold of him, we're going to be fine. And I need to rephrase that. Because actually it's not in our strength. It's him who's got all the us. That really matters. In John it talks about that we are in God's hand. In Jesus' hand. And then it says that we're also in the Father's hand. It's kind of like, you can't get out unless you're really kicking stream and struggling and jump out. But we are, we have an anchor, that's Jesus, and he's got all of us. You see, sometimes we wonder why God's not opening up the things he wants for us, and I've talked to himself as well as to you guys, and sometimes he says, because I've put an anchor in place just to hold you long enough, but you do anything stupid. He loves you too much, guys, to, to do everything that you think you deserve. He loves you too much to let you run that course into a brick wall. Have you ever seen those YouTube clips or videos where it shows you a kid flying down the road on a bike? And it's, it's usually one of my watches called uh, Amazing Dads. And like the kids flying down and dad just flies past them and picks them up before the, rap, the bike smashes into a lamppost. There's one where a kid flicks over on the sofa and dad reaches out and catches Now I'm assuming mums would do the same, but dads do have spider sensors. You know, especially to kids, they're the heroes. And whatever's going I remember, we, in a, as old house, who was in our garden, it had a nice block paved area, and it had it's two gardens and four steps going down to the grass area. And when Ethan was little, he used to have one of these run around the garden, you know, legs in wheels, scuttle around just before he could Well, he'd come flying outside the house at speed, running like mad in his little baby walker, and he, he nose dived into the flower bed which meant he flicked out and there's a wall and then a, a two or three foot drop and I did the no you know run up and I scratched it actually started, scratched it along the wall as he flooded against my hand and I flicked him over landed on his feet and he looked up and goes again <laughs> you know he's I mean? like my arm's killing there's grazes down it and he's going again <laughs> you know what I mean which is a boy for guys so soon and he was off, he wanted to do it again. But God's like that. There are times when we do crash out of control and he's the one that catches us. 
but he would prefer us not to crash our way. That's why we need his anchors, solid and firm. Now, man. So I hope that's been encouraging for you, because my alarm's just about to go off. I'm being a blessing for you. Do get your anchors sort of, so what are our anchors? I'll reread them for you. Our anchors is having, um, number one, when I find that one, realizing our present position, concentrating our future hope, reconcile God's purpose for our lives, recalling God's love for our lives, and rejoicing in, the, in God's person. So I hope that's been a blessing for you and an encouragement. Amen.